taken you over. And you must be humble in the face of it. The things they can do. The thinking behind it was just to slightly think about the show in a new way. So there was certainly there's one of like there's there's a couple of episodes that were almost written as as horror. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like like as horror stories and like throwing out the rule book of what Black Mirror is. And that then freshens and there was also and then and there were also episodes set in the past, which is another sort of things that Black Mirror hasn't done. Because I think I was thinking well, if I close my eyes and picture the cliched version of what a Black Mirror episode is, it's somebody today looking at a transparent phone for some <laughs> reason, uh, frowning and staring and crying or putting a VR nubbin on their head. And I sort of wanted to avoid doing that because I've done a lot of that and there's lots of shows that are doing that. So I kind of wanted to freshen it up and shake things up for a season. So hopefully that's what we've achieved. I don't know why I said achieved in such a weird but musical way. When ChatGPT came along, I, like anyone else, I went there and tried out all various things. You type in prompts and you, I'd get it to do, I did a show called Kunk on Earth. So one of the things I'd do would like, describe such and such in the style of Philomena Kunk, for instance, or come up with, a, what's a story, tell me a Black Mirror story. So not, I wasn't trying to get it to write a script because I don't think it would do that. And when if you type in, come up with a Black Mirror episode idea, it, it vomits out something that at first glance looks plausible as a certainly I could imagine somebody pitching it to me, mm. but it's also quite derivative because all it's really doing is hoovering up things that other humans, we <laughs> have written um, and it's trying to pass itself off as a human effectively what it's doing. So, so it's not, it's, and I can understand why. So it's not actually, it's, it can't really replace a human writer at the moment, because it can't actually come up with messy original ideas. But I can see that maybe to maybe some people, it, it, it might appear that it is. And so I think the, the, the thing that's worrying writers is, are executives going to use ChatGPT to generate a synopsis that they're then going to have to get a human writer in to make usable? And actually, what you've got there is you've hired a human writer to do a human writer's job, but you're sort of, but they're, you're pretending their boss is, is this chat GPT thingy. I can see that those tools are useful tools for writers, for human writers to use in the same way that there's tools in Photoshop that are useful for artists. But I think they should always be tools for human writers, not, not tools that are used to bash human writers over their head. <laughs> Um, that's a good question. I mean, hopefully the show isn't... I, I get frustrated when people say, oh, Black Mirror, that's the show about how phones are evil. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, and I think that's what we, we failed if it feels like that didactic. Um, so I guess it's, it's human stories, hopefully. Yeah. I think it's one of those things, anytime you pick up a Charlie Black Mirror script or I think you turn on an episode, I, hopefully you can relate to the characters. I think what's kind of horrible and amazing and... Fun also is being able to go, what would I do in that situation? And I think that's there in every story. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh my God. Uh, what? New drama, Joan is awful. Is that Selma Hayek? Uh, she even has your hair. <laughs> that's not my hair. Hello, Istanbul! <laughs> I think probably Zalma can actually speak to this better than I can because she's in a... I'm not trying to pass this off on you. But I think, you know, it is a... It's a... The subject of the, of the show is such a scary prospect because so much, as you said, so much misinformation can be put out there and it's just kind of gobbled up by the masses as truth.
Mm. And we uh, start to, I feel like people in, you know, a place of massive celebrity, uh, people just paint a picture of them based on the articles that they read and the pictures that they see. And I, um, the, the actual person who's just a, <laughs> at the end of the day, a, a real person on this earth um, gets blurred and their identities start to evaporate in the, in the eyes of like, of the masses. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a lot to process. <laughs> I think that uh, more in the cultural misinformation, there are, when you're a, somebody that everybody knows, everybody makes their fantasy of who you are. And it gave me a great opportunity to play on those fantasies as a parody, as a parody of it and be the different means that people think I am. And it's such a great opportunity and to have a sense of humor about yourself and a sense of humor about what other things think about you. And also I had such an amazing partner here. And he also gave me opportunities to show the insecurities that happen to any regular person because it gives me an opportunity to also be a regular person. You know, at some point she makes a big statement about who I am. And you realize that I really, deep inside, even though I pretend I'm like super entitled, I, ha I, I don't even believe I am that. In, and it takes a regular person to point it out to me. And I'm so grateful because I'm so full of doubt about myself. And uh, what was the question? <laughs> I would say I would love to see like um, like Al Pacino give it a shot. Oh, I'd I'd like Oprah Winfrey oh. to play me. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll take it. The man is lost. And we both feel that you could use a break. I think I'd like that very much. Well, they, they sent me this script and I was so excited to see what it was going to be because I've, I've been a huge fan of Black Mirror forever. Um, and I was really excited to be a part of it, a part of this story specifically. Um, I love the time period that it's set in, um, in 1969-ish, right? Um, and I love that it explores... Um, you know, these relationships and, um, and, you know, he, the importance of human connection. I, I was really excited about it. And the twists and turns um, definitely um, were pretty um, riveting as well. Yeah. I mean, I was such a big fan of the show uh, that I didn't care what the script was. Honestly, I was going to say, I was going to be a part of it no matter what. If I was like sweeping the floors in the background of a scene, like that's fine. I just want to be involved in it because it doesn't seem like uh, clearly he hadn't made anything in four years. And um, who knew? I, we didn't, I didn't, nobody really knew if another one was going to happen. So when they sent the script and they said they were making another one, I was excited as a fan because I was like, oh, I get to see more Black Mirror. But I also get to be in one, which is double. Yeah, very exciting. I think uh, isolation and loneliness is probably one of the least kind of explored um, mental health issues of the time. Like I, I, I find that most, not everything, but there are lots of things that can tra be traced back to what's going on with a person at a particular moment uh, if they are dealing with some sort of isolation. And obviously during the pandemic, during the lockdown, um, I think Charlie's talked about this a lot. He wrote this script during lockdown and he was thinking a lot about that as well. And it happened to a lot of people in, in that time where they became so isolated from, from, from people that they were used to seeing and even just, the, just, just bumping into people on the street. And it had a severe, severe uh, effect on, on people's mental health. And so I kind of feel like 
I was more empathetic toward David than maybe the script was. Uh, I I kind of understood what I mean. Didn't understand exactly the the lengths the you know what he ends up doing, but but I could understand the motivation behind needing that connection. And in that situation, God, there's almost any you, you could almost do anything instead of spending four more years completely isolate, isolated. I think that like like Josh had mentioned about his feelings towards, you know, the character he's playing, I f feel similarly to, you know, my sort of empathy towards towards Lana, the character I play. I mean, in my experience and opinion, it, there's nothing really harder than spending time away from your family. You know, in our our jobs, we we experience it a lot. Um because of where we, you know, film certain things or, you know, uh, filming obviously can be like really intense um, hours for specific amounts of time. And so you go for, for long periods without seeing your, your spouse or your um, kids, God forbid. And like, I, and so we all like have experienced some version of that. And so for Lana, you know, when her husband comes and goes, and even when he's there, and doesn't feel like he's there to her. I think that that's really, really excruciating. Um, and so that's kind of easy to tap into because you can, you know, from experience, I think everyone has, um, you know, had some type of um, experience in their own lives where they just miss the people that they love. Um, and yeah, I just, I was, I was, I was really interested in exploring that um, part of this story. Nick's offering 30K for the first photo over. 30K? 30K. 40, if you catch her looking like a junkie. I've been um, hitting up all my peeps, but no leads, nothing. Nada. I, I really liked the sort of the commentary it was making on um, what what this culture, which I think, you know, the episode takes place in 2006, and I think uh, sort of the paparazzi culture and harassment of young women, young celebrity women, it, it was at a huge peak at that point. Um, and social media kind of changed a little bit about about what a mega celebrity is and and um superstardom <clears throat> but you know I, I do still think we are in a culture of like obsession and uh, i guess we always are maybe that's just inherently human um but that it it does drive people to um insanity and um and privacy and respect of space I, I think is incredibly important and i and i think particularly now with everything being photographed all the time it does change how we interact in the world and maybe this isn't so much in, in a sort of state of harassment but the idea of that always feeling watched which i think a lot of us do because anybody can just pick up a phone at any point um it changes our behavior like i was reading this article about how parties um you know parties are different how people interact because there's always the fear of being recorded the way children even like interact with each other they're they're more risk averse because they're afraid of like failing and having that go public and stuff like that and so i think that i don't know all interplays into sort of themes mm -hmm. of the episode and yeah I think that there's a there's a twist. I don't know how much we can we can talk about here, but there's uh, uh, yeah, so a physical and mental challenge in a specific scene. Uh, but I think overall, I think the whole script sort of victimizes, uh, not really victim, objectifies and, and dehumanizes Maisie. And uh, I think that the greatest sort of challenge is to um it's not a challenge but you know i i had to really fend for her to protect her and had to 
um, provide her with as much respect and um, and yeah, as as the paparazzi lacked for her. We take this anywhere. The first question any platform, network, whatever is going to ask is, what's the hook? And what's the context? There is a personal angle. I mean, his dad was one of the victims. Uh, yeah, he, w he was a policeman. He was shot at the farm. That's really interesting. That's that's a that's an intense question. Um, <laughs> where does where does that instinct come from us as human beings? I think, I think it's to do with with uh, you know putting ourselves into those situations, seeing other people go through suffering, feels satisfying to us in some way, and uh, you know it does it does <laughs> because because you imagine yourself in their shoes. And you compare how maybe in your head you would react compared to how they react. And I think that mm. I think that we have this drive for truth to find out the the truth. But we, well, it's a big question. It <laughs> but is. It's, it but, really is. You know, uh, the place w where we are in society right now. We're in this. Uh, I read. I listened to this really. I'm not going to go too deep into this. <laughs> uh, I listened to this really interesting podcast about conflict and about high conflict. And high conflict is something where. We are in a place now where the argument is more important than what's being argued about. Mm. And this spiral of argument draws us always to the negatives. Preach. And I feel like in that political sphere, that's also the case when we, you know, when we want to consume entertainment. We're interested in darkness. We're going down a rabbit hole. So I think it comes from lots of places. But yeah, we are. We're knee deep Ooh. in it now. Yeah, we're wah, heading wah, down. Wah. I try to live by having zero expectations of what my audience will take away. I allow that to be entirely up to them. So at a base level, I hope they're entertained because I'm an entertainer. <laughs> um, you know, on the on the psychological side, I'm gonna let that I'm gonna leave that up to them. Go, go. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. What would you want to make it about? What would I want to make a documentary about? You would want to make a documentary about the life of me. Yeah. My life. So my documentary would be all about uh, my Harlow Herald. Uh, it would it would be intense and <laughs> lovely and horrible. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> That's what I'd make my documentary about. Okay. Honestly, the only thing I can think about is like cat videos. Um, so I maybe like about cats, because I love cats so much and I find them very interesting. Stunning. Stunning. Yeah. Stunning. It was wonderful. Yeah. The, the only caveat I think is I, we discovered midges. Oh, those sweet, sweet midges. What midges, midges are. Yeah. Oh my God. I had like, there was one, there were so many at one point when we were shooting. <laughs> That, that I like pulled my eyelid back and scraped one like from out of my eye. There was like a live bug inside of <laughs> me, inside of my face. So don't love that. But everything else was like amazing. Great food. Yes. Really good restaurants. It was like stunningly beautiful. Sam took a dip in a lay in the in the loch. I did. I had a dangerous swim in, you the, did. in, in Loch Lomond on, on one of the days because we were filming up there, you know, and I was just amazed that we were based in Glasgow, but you drive half an hour up the road to Luss, which is around where we were filming. You know, you drive half an hour out of the city and you're in the, the lowlands. You, you're you know, inside you're, the water. You're in the <laughs> Literally, I arrived and I just mean, went into the water. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, it was absolutely stunning and beautiful. It was good. Yeah, yeah. it was nice. Just the only one tasting. Oh, 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 I see him. He's perfect. Piece of work, that one. String of burglaries. Mostly targets the elderly. What do you reckon? No? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow, that's such a good question. <laughs> um, she's someone, I think, who um, it's very hard being her 
this brown girl in 1979 with the social and political climate that, you know, England is in at that time, in this town that's very white. She's, there's a loneliness and a melancholy to her. You know, there's a question mark over her background. Her mother, you know, she's on her own. Her mother has passed away. Um, she doesn't seem to have any friends. Um, she has these microaggressions that happen to her in the workplace, um, in her neighborhood. And I think it's these sort of everyday cruelties that sort of diminish her and chip away at her. And it makes someone sort of make themselves smaller and shrinks herself in order to just blend into the background, to assimilate in a way that she's never, she never wants to make a scene. She never wants, she just wants, she just takes everything on the chin and then represses that so deep down. So when you have those moments where she fantasizes something really dark, I think it's because she's repressed so much inside that the only way you see the dark side is in this very like heightened moment mm. of like fantasy. Um, because in real life, she doesn't have the language or the ability to act out or defend herself or speak up because it's not a world that she feels she can do that. And I think it's true of a lot of like early first immigration, first generation immigrants who move into a society. They just kind of, they want to assimilate and not make a scene. They want to just sort of um, not make trouble, you know? And I think uh, that's what she tries to do. But in, in that process, she shrinks herself into someone that's very small. You know what? Um... I hate to say it, but I, I was very, very unfamiliar with Boney M until, until um, the day Charlie uh, suggested it to me as a potential inspiration for, for, for GUP. Um, and then, yeah, dove in. They've got some big bangers, you know? Rasputin, is, is River, yeah. Rivers of Babylon, is that them? I think so. That's a big banger. What else is there? <laughs> Ah, that was two. on your character playlist, <laughs> not on mine. You know what? Those two are really great. So I like those two. <laughs> Hate it. I'm actually not. I find yeah, it terrifying. I mean, I have seen, you know, uh, I remember like a defining moment of my childhood, like, you know, I was in a girls' school and we all like secretly watched The Exorcist and we were like screaming and crying because it was so terrifying. And I think that kind of... Um, I watched that too young, so that just terrified yeah. me. And I feel like I don't like naturally go into, oh, I want to watch a horror movie because I'm a bit of a scaredy cat. Have you ever seen Paranormal Activity? No. <sighs> that one's crazy. That one will actually yeah. mean that you'll never sleep again. Like The Ring, I remember being terrified of The Ring. And the, the Japanese original was yeah. genuinely even more terrifying than the Hollywood remake. Um, but no, I don't know horror no. very well. Um, you know, in 1979, they were saying, stop immigration. These days, politicians are different faces, um, but same ideology. It's still stop the boats, you know, it's still stop immigration. Um, that ideology comes around a lot. And I think, yeah, it is a, a critique, I guess you could say, of um, politi politicians that, um, that sort of churn out the same ideology.